Welcome back to the Last Days Book Club, where we are reading the book entitled Pioneers Together by Josephine Cunnington Edwards. This book is a biography of Roy F. Cottrell and his wife Marty, who were both born in 1878 and led an exciting life of service and mission in the early days of the young and rapidly growing Seventh-day Adventist Church. In our last reading, we covered chapter 14, entitled, In Peril, Trial, and Triumph, where there certainly was a great threat of peril and many trials were encountered. Roy and Murty went to a town called Hua Yong on Lake Ting Tung to conduct meetings with a growing group of believers. As the meetings were going on, a large armed and angry mob organized by two Catholic priests, attacked the meeting, and had it not been for the intervention of 100 soldiers, chaos would have ensued and many would have been killed. The mob, however, then attacked the soldiers' quarters in retaliation, and a serious fight ensued, with quite a few of the mobsters being killed. The authorities were very upset over the matter, and were very apologetic to the Cottrells and the SDA mission. The riot created much publicity, not only in the town, but around the larger cities in China, where the Catholic attackers were excoriated and embarrassed, while the missionaries were lauded and their case much advanced. In another event, Roy was traveling to conduct meetings and baptisms, when the coolie carrying their possessions, absconded with everything, and Roy spent a few days in real Chinese style, with only the clothes on his back, but nonetheless enjoyed great camaraderie with his native brothers and sisters. In yet another incident, Roy was traveling by sailboat to another appointment, when a terrific gale hit their little sailboat, breaking its mast sending its sails flying in the ferocious winds, and threatening to capsize the boat, which was tossed violently over the surging waters. They prayed fervently, as Roy remembered another storm in another boat, where Jesus spoke to the waves and winds, saying, Peace, be still. Within an hour, the gale had subsided, and they found themselves on a little island, marooned, since the boat was damaged beyond repair. The island also was home to pirates and thieves, but the Lord protected them, and a passing cargo boat rescued them and took them back to civilization. Through it all, missions, companies, and churches were formed, baptisms abounded, and the mission work in China grew. We pick up the story now in chapter 15, entitled, What Doest Thou Here? In the springtime of 1913, 400 Protestant missionaries gathered in the Yale Mission Auditorium at Changsha. Roy accepted an official invitation to attend. During the last session of the conference, the question of Christian unity and areas of operation was being considered. At length, a minister arose, and with deep feeling and quiet, I would like to know what the Seventh-day Adventists are doing here anyway, that they should come to agitate and disturb the minds of our simple Christian believers. Numerous voices shouted, Hear, hear! And considerable turmoil prevailed. When quiet was restored, Roy felt impressed to reply. And being recognized by the chairman, he spoke as follows. Brethren and sisters, we honor and esteem these pioneer missionaries, who for so many decades have been blazing the trail of Christian service in this dark land. And we are not here 
to oppose any good work. But as we read the scriptures, we are convinced that there are certain vital and essential truths that are not being taught or sufficiently emphasized by the majority of missionaries. If they did teach a complete gospel as we understand it, there would be no excuse for our entering China as a separate organization. Nevertheless, since we sincerely feel that this is not being done, we feel it is our Christian duty to enter China as well as all other lands with the simple gospel of Christ. All eyes were upon him as he continued. Regarding a division of territory with specified geographic limits where a mission may or may not operate, we could not conscientiously subscribe to such an agreement. We understand that in some mission fields, Baptist missionaries take a similar stand. They believe that if baptism by immersion is essential on one side of a geographic line, it is equally essential on the other. We also hear that in neighboring provinces, our Episcopalian brethren have definite convictions concerning the apostolic succession. And in the teaching of this doctrine, they do not believe they should be limited to certain prescribed localities. Accordingly, friends, Seventh-day Adventists are happy to cooperate with other missions in ways where no principle is at stake. But regarding areas of operation, we are compelled to take our stand with John Wesley, who declared, The world is my parish. As Roy sat down, the storm really broke. Some thought he should be expelled from the convention. Another proposed that large quantities of D.M. Canwright's tracts be secured, one of which should be placed in every Christian home in that part of central China. It was amazing to see the hatred and intolerance in the eyes of men and women pledged to preach the pure gospel of Christ to the brethren. Feeling the looks of hostility, Roy felt sad. Yet, he sat, head erect, happy to be a Seventh-day Adventist. It seemed then as if everyone in that vast assembly was against him. But later, he was to learn that all had not bowed the knee to Baal. As the tempest partially subsided, the chairman, a veteran Methodist missionary, asked the indulgence of the assembly to say a few words. Brethren, he said, if anyone wishes to know why Mr. Cottrell is here as a delegate, let me say that I invited him. Furthermore, we have found the Adventist mission to be a very helpful factor in this community. About a year ago, Mr. Cooper, the dean of our Bible seminary, was ill. Mr. and Mrs. Cottrell invited the Coopers over to their home on the island. There, our dean received various health hints and a wholesome, hygienic diet and was soon able to return to us greatly improved. Last summer, a newly arrived Baptist family faced a real problem. Their small mission compound is located in one of the hottest sections of this city and the wife was about to have a baby. Hearing of this, Mrs. Cottrell invited them to her comfortable home on the island. And there, through her kindness, the new little Baptist missionary made his appearance. Now everyone knows a missionary family's life is more or less a fishbowl existence. 
very little privacy is enjoyed by any true missionary. And I dare say that if any one of you who have said unkind things today were to go to the Cotrells for help, you would receive it. I also understand that some of the Presbyterian delegates to this convention are now being entertained at the Adventist mission. Let me tell you that the latch string at their home always hangs on the outside for anyone in need. I know it from many sources, and as chairman of this convention, I wish to request that in the report of our proceedings, no word of disfavor or criticism of our Adventist friends shall appear. His request was granted. Several of the speakers withdrew their unfavorable remarks. The head of the Yale University mission stated, In my opinion, there are no legitimate grounds on which to reproach our Adventist friends. A few months later, when a prominent Changsha missionary, who had also been one of the outstanding critics at the convention, lost his wife, he invited Roy to participate in the funeral services. He too learned that Seventh-day Adventists make good friends. During that summer, Dr. Foster, a young physician of the Yale University School of Medicine, roomed with the Cottrells in their island home. On one occasion, there came from a nearby dwelling the pitiful cries and moans of a young woman in childbirth. The Chinese midwives were baffled by the complications, and the case became critical. Murty's heart ached for the young sufferer, and she called at the home to offer the kindly services of the American doctor. Please let me bring Dr. Foster over here, she pleaded. Without a physician, your wife may die. Just look how she is suffering. The young woman, after all her hours of agony, looked hardly human. Her temples were hollow. It was as though her face was turned to putty and hammered out long by fiendish hands. Her eyes were half closed and only the whites were showing. Her hands wandered over the tumbled bed cover. Her nails had turned blue and even the skin was strangely shriveled. She was moaning but not like a normal person. It was more like a helpless animal in the last throes of life. A panting sound filled the room. But the husband refused, saying it would be better for his wife to die than to permit a gentleman physician to attend her. So nothing could be done. Murty went home weeping. The cries drew fainter and fainter until death brought relief to the unfortunate sufferer. Such was the arbitrary code of false modesty that then prevailed in many parts of old China. One day Dr. Foster said to Murty, Mrs. Cottrell, have you ever done any nursing? Very little, she replied. Well, continued the doctor, your nearest foreign neighbor on the north is quite ill. You probably know that the Honorable Mrs. Cross, wife of the Changsha Commission of Customs, is the highest ranking English lady in China. Her father was a British nobleman, and she served as maid of honor to Queen Victoria. Now she does not want a Chinese nurse. But if you will be willing to go over for an hour or two a day, I will give specific instructions for her treatments, and I'm sure you will qualify as a very acceptable nurse. Murty was willing. She found Mrs. Cross to be a delightful person, cultured and refined, who spoke the pure King's English with rare elegance and charm. 
She was a most cooperative patient, and as she grew stronger, she recounted many of the intriguing personal incidents which occurred at the court of St. James during the illustrious reign of Queen Victoria. Between Mrs. Cross and Murty, a beautiful friendship developed, and the Seventh-day Adventist missionaries in Changsha became the recipients of many favors from this gracious, grateful lady. Among the fourteen servants employed in her household were two gardeners, and as various rare vegetables ripened in the garden, the Cottrells were generously remembered. Also, on hot summer evenings, when the thermometer registered over a hundred degrees, a spin up and down the river or around the island in the Commissioner's motor launch was both refreshing and invigorating. A year later, when World War I burst upon Europe, it was Mrs. Cross who first received the startling news in a telephone conversation from Shanghai. She had once relayed the dreadful message to Murty, adding, Many times I heard grand old Queen Victoria remark, Oh, that nephew of mine, Kaiser Wilhelm, some day he will plunge the nations into a bloodbath. And now the Queen's prophecy had come to pass. Previous to this, Roy and Murty had been making arrangements for their furlough, which was nearly due. They expected to return to America via India, the Holy Land, and Europe, and had already placed an order with Montgomery Ward and the company for various items of clothing and equipment that they would need for this trip. How suddenly human plans can be shattered. In the meantime, a new headquarters for the Central China Union Mission was being constructed in Hankow, and as soon as living accommodations were available, Roy and Murty moved to the new location. As superintendent of the mission program in the four great provinces of this union, Roy could more advantageously administer the work from this natural geographic center. Pioneer literature evangelists had already penetrated Kiangsi province, and in December of that year, two of them reported a substantial group of believers in a somewhat isolated town of that province. Roy and Murty were eager to visit the group. Accordingly, they boarded a river steamer one evening, slept on a board berth, and before dawn, disembarked on a secluded beach. Hour after hour, they swung along the country trails by sedan chairs, and in the late afternoon, while traveling by wheelbarrow, they met a native Christian who urged them to turn aside and remain at his home for the night. They accepted his kind invitation, and on the outskirts of a country town, found his home to be a compound some fifty feet square, surrounded by a sun-baked brick wall about fifteen feet high. Inside, the rooms were built around an open court. Glowing charcoal in the fireplace gave some warmth. As soon as supper was over, the host inquired, Shepherd, shall I go out and invite neighbors and friends to come in for a little meeting? Very well, Roy replied. In a few minutes, the court was filled with visitors, most of whom had never before heard the Christian gospel. It was Christmas Eve, and with rapt attention, the friends eagerly listened to the wonderful story of Bethlehem. It was a unique opportunity. Christian literature was distributed to the guests, and it was hoped that the seed sowing would be a fruit for the master. When the visitors had all departed to their homes, a familiar question was asked, Can the American lady climb a ladder? Yes, she could climb. So arrangements were made 
for Roy and Mertie to sleep on the mezzanine floor, a kind of loft or scaffold under the roof that extended over part of the open court. Cots and bedding were quickly prepared, lights extinguished, and prayers offered. The weary travelers were drifting into slumberland when, in an excited whisper, Mertie exclaimed, Roy, what's that? What's that, an earthquake? Oh, nothing so serious, came the reply. I think they have brought the cows into the court below, and one of them is rubbing her shoulder against the pillar. The cattle disturbed some of the other sleepers, and soon a chorus of typical noises came from barnyard fowls. Why, this is just like the first Christmas night at Bethlehem, remarked Roy. Here we are, in the stable with the animals. Then sound sleep came to the wayfarers. In the morning, they required no alarm clock, for with the first rays of dawn, the donkey from the court below began his musical hee-haw, hee-haw. Soon followed morning rice, worship, and the farewells. On this December morning, the trail wound its way through picturesque canyons and over wooded hills and low mountains. Along the way, Christmas holly grew wild and in abundance. If this could only be transported to some great American city, remarked Roy, what a contribution to missions might be made. On reaching their destination, they found that the native believers had provided and furnished a neat little chapel. Here they held meetings for several days, examined candidates for baptism, and on one bright, crisp dawning, led the group to a nearby pond. It was frozen over with ice, about three-fourths of an inch thick, but no one hesitated. With heavy poles, a portion of the ice was broken, and fourteen new believers followed their Lord and emerged from the chilling waters with radiant faces and a determination to live the new life in Christ. That afternoon, the first Seventh-day Adventist church in Kiangsi province was organized. The next morning, as two very happy people started on their homeward trip, they remarked again and again, this was truly the most wonderful Christmas we have ever known. For months, our missionaries in the Far East had been anticipating a visit from the President of the General Conference. And as Roy and Murty returned to Hankow, they learned of dramatic events occurring in the Indian Ocean. The German light cruiser Emden had been raiding the seas and had sunk 15 enemy ships. About this time, Elder and Mrs. A.G. Daniels had finished their tour of India and embarked on a passenger liner for Singapore. The officers of this ship soon learned that they were being trailed by the Emden. Absolute darkness at night was the captain's order, and for many hours the vessel followed a zigzag course. Then the new Australian cruiser SS Sydney took up the chase, overhauled the Emden in the nick of time, and sent her to the bottom. Our missionaries rejoiced to learn of this deliverance, and the date for the general meeting in central China was set for the middle of February. On Friday night before the expected arrival of Elder Daniels, a high wind caused doors, windows, and shutters to rattle perilously. Roy and Murty were trying to sleep in a bedroom on the second floor, when about midnight they were awakened by the shrill sound of a police whistle. Roy sprang out of bed, opened the window and called, What's the trouble? Bandits have broken into your house, came the reply. Upon investigation, it was found that they had cut a hole through the panel of a door, had ransacked several rooms, 
and had taken a quantity of office supplies, most of the recently arrived order of goods from Montgomery Ward, and worst of all, the entire wardrobe of warm winter clothing. On Sabbath, Roy went to the chapel to preach, wearing a patched suit of clothes. On Sunday morning, Mertie and he hastened to a Chinese tailor shop with the anxious question, Can you make this clothing and have it ready for us by Tuesday afternoon? Yes, they would try. And surprisingly, the new outfits were finished on time. Returning home with their purchases, they saw a strange procession approaching their mission compound. Two carrier coolies with filled baskets escorted by two policemen. It was the stolen loot returning. As the baskets were unpacked, practically every lost item was recovered and in good condition. Well, how did you find all this? exclaimed Roy. Oh, on the night of the robbery, replied the police surgeon, one of the bandits was entering the old native city. He bumped square into one of our patrolmen and was arrested. At the police station, we saw clearly that he had been robbing a foreigner's residence, and we demanded that he give the names of the other members of his gang. He refused, so we tied cords around his thumbs and hoisted him up by a windlass. Twice he gave fictitious names, but finally, as he was suspended in the air by his thumbs, we applied the bamboo to his back. He then gave correct names and addresses of all members of his gang. We now have every one of them in jail, and I think we have recovered all of your goods that were stolen. I hope everything is satisfactory now. Yes, replied Roy. Almost everything seems to be here and how we thank you for your efficient service. What will be done with the bandits? That's not decided yet. In all probability, they will be executed. Oh, exclaimed Murty. That would be too cruel. Keep them in prison for a time. Give them hard labor, but don't put them to death. We shall see, said the surgeon, and with a wave of his hand, he was gone. Early the following morning, Roy left by train to welcome Elder Daniels, who was arriving from the north, and to join him in a series of meetings to be held in Honan, Hankou, Nanking, and Shanghai. His month-long visit brought great inspiration to all the workers. At this time, Roy and Murty had been working in China for more than seven years, and it was decided that they should take their furlough. On their return across the Pacific, they spent a wonderful day in Hawaii, where both fellow workers and strangers extended their characteristic aloha. When they arrived at the wharf in San Francisco, the first persons they recognized on the dock were those cherished friends who years before had been the last to bid them farewell in New England, Elder and Mrs. E. W. Farnsworth. Now they were the first to welcome them back at the Golden Gate. As soon as the eager greetings were over, Uncle Eugene remarked, Well, good people, you're just four days too late to attend the funeral services of Mrs. E. G. White. Her son, W. C. White, has now gone with the casket to lay the dear mother beside her husband in Oak Hill Cemetery at Battle Creek. So, her tireless and wonderful pen is now at rest, observed Roy. What a gift, and what a blessing it has been to this church for these past 70 years. We do wish we might have seen her once more, added Murty. But now, we'll have to wait until she awakens in the resurrection morning. Not long after this, Elder White returned to California. Meeting the arrivals from China, he said, 
Well, brother and sister Cottrell, we're glad you're back from the Far East safely. I've been thinking about you. Brother Chrysler and I are planning to make selections from the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy that we believe would be most vital and helpful to our people who speak other languages. Could you and your good wife come and help us? No one is now living in Elmshaven. It's just the way Mother left it, and I'm sure you could be very comfortable there. If you can join us in our work, Elm's Haven will be your home for as long as you can stay. Roy and Murty were very happy to accept. They considered it a wonderful privilege to live in the quaint old home where the servant of God had spent her sunset years and to have free access to the vault where the vast volumes of inspired messages were stored. For a few months, Roy and Murty resided at Anguin, where Roy completed his college course. Then at the request of the General Conference, they spent some time visiting training schools, union conference sessions, camp meetings and churches, speaking in over 50 different places and interviewing many candidates for overseas service. By the 1st of August, 1916, they were back at the Golden Gate, where during one week, more than 60 mission appointees embarked for the Far East. 42 of this number were passengers on the good ship SS China. With this interesting and enthusiastic group of young missionaries, Roy and Murty were en route for their second term of service in old China. The End of Chapter 15 Chapter 16 An Eventful Voyage It was a congenial and enthusiastic group of missionaries who boarded the old SS China and sailed out from the Golden Gate on that August day in 1916. As they stood at the rail and watched the shoreline of their homeland recede into the far distance, they would have been more than human had they gazed on the scene unmoved. Well, they knew that changes, sad and glad, would take place before their eyes would again behold their native country. Even as they sailed, the sad realization pressed upon them that across the world in Europe, the greatest war of all time was raging. The crack German army had invaded Belgium and made the supreme effort to knock France out quickly only to be unexpectedly hindered by the brave little Belgian army. Both sides dug in for the long struggle and faced each other across no man's land, while huge cannon poured millions of shells on soldiers crouching in the mud trenches. The missionaries, though uneasy about world conditions, went out with cheerful hearts to their chosen task of preparing people for the coming of the Lord. Because the 42 members of the group completely filled the seats in the dining salon of the old liner, by mutual consent, they ate at the second serving throughout the long voyage. The great ship plowed ever westward, while passengers lay in reclining chairs, walked the decks, or were entertained by the flying fish, the occasional spouting of a whale, or the fins of sharks that sometimes followed the ship. Every day when the weather was pleasant, the missionaries met for a sing and a Bible study, while those appointed to Mandarin-speaking China were delighted with the interesting language class conducted daily by Roy. Their interest was keen and their progress quick, and it was not long until they were practicing with one another using sentences they learned. Like all true missionaries, they were eager to get into the harness. Some of the company had endured the throes of seasickness, the miserable dizzy nausea which turns the stomach upside down and inside out at even the sight or smell of food. Some were just getting their sea legs when they were afforded a little respite by a 12-hour stopover in Honolulu. The visit to Honolulu was a delightful occasion. 
under the world-famous wide-spreading banyan tree near Waikiki Beach. A uniform ukulele band entertained the visitors with romantic Hawaiian music. And the church people served a sumptuous native feast fit for royalty. Even though the favorite native food, poai, was not to the visitors as delightful to the eye or the taste buds as it was to the islanders, there was an abundance of other food to tempt the palate. Pineapple, dripping with its luscious juice, ten kinds of bananas, papayas, coconuts, baked plantains, and other delicacies. At the close of the banquet, Cars were provided to take all members of the party on sightseeing tours around the island. What a day it was. During the following week, the ship plowed through unruffled seas, as if the old ocean were trying to live up to the name Pacific. The sunsets were so beautiful that they seemed to be glimpses of future glory. Entranced, the missionaries gazed on the changing colors, thinking of the glad hour when he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. But alas, such calm could continue only so long. Veteran sailors looked upon peaceful weather as a possible prelude to what the Pacific really could do when she was stirred up. The blue skies faded, and angry yellowish-green clouds darkened the heavens. Strong winds lashed the heavy seas into a fury of a fierce typhoon. The captain turned the ship about, and for eighteen hours let her run before the storm. The din was terrific. In the small cabins the passengers sat huddled while the floor tipped back and forth. Toilet articles fell off dresses, chairs walked, and baggage slid from one side of the stateroom to the other. Regular meals were well nigh impossible. Bread, butter, cold cuts of meat, cheese, hard-boiled eggs, and a little fruit were prepared for the few who were not seasick. Ropes were put up so that the passengers could steady themselves as they tried to walk. Life became a business of hanging on to something and wishing for the day. With one propeller disabled, the SS China creaked and plunged before the fury of the wind and towering waves. Even the members of the crew were pale with terror, their minds full of the tragedies of the seas. While here and there, groups of missionaries, far more calm than the others, met for special prayer and devotion. But all things come to an end. Patches of blue sky finally appeared. Passengers walked the decks again, and balmy breezes from the South Seas fanned their faces. Down in the galley, the cooks and workers sang as they prepared an ample, hot, and tasty meal. The sideboards of the table were removed, and a happy group of voyagers met to partake of the first good meal they had tasted for many long hours. Though battered and in need of repair, the SS China was still afloat with its precious cargo, and with but one propeller, it went limping and creaking at a snail's pace into the colorful harbor of Yokohama, Japan. Engineers came aboard, and after hours of labor, the broken segment of the propeller shaft was removed. It was such a small piece that it could easily be carried in one hand, yet it had caused the peril of a great ship. It required four days at the iron shops to fashion a new piece before the journey could be resumed. Normally, those on board who had pledged their lives to the service of God could perceive a vital spiritual lesson in this time-consuming experience. They saw the inconvenience and peril occasioned by this one small broken piece of steel. In the same way, great havoc may be wrought in the life and in service for Christ through one flaw or defect in the character. At long last, the boat was again on its way across the yellow waters of the South China Sea. Reaching Shanghai, the sea-weary voyagers found a warm welcome waiting. But another nerve-wracking experience was also in store. Just after their heaps of luggage had been piled on the dock, a heavy tropical downpour 
saturated everything that was not completely waterproof. Many tedious hours were spent in unpacking and drying the contents. Some things were completely ruined. From lip to lip the word passed. Take joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Marvelously, this message of the Apostle Paul, penned 19 centuries earlier, was used to cheer and hearten dejected spirits. The end of chapter 16 of Pioneers Together by Josephine Cunnington Edwards.